And everything in life, there's always the good news and the bad news. Are you with me on that? You know, I always say that to my wife. I go, I got good news and I got bad news. And she's always like, why do you always have to do that? You know, and I just do. I always just bring it that way. Well, somebody sent me this and I thought it was pretty funny. The good news and the bad news for a pastor. And uh, this will get us ready for what we're going to look at in chapter 5. The good news, you baptized seven people today in the river. Bad news, you lost two of them in the swift current. The good news, the Women's Guild voted to send you a get well card. The bad news, the vote passed by a 31 to 30 vote. You didn't get it. Okay, <laughs> never mind. The good news, the Elder Board accepted your job description the way you wrote it. The bad news, they were so inspired by it, they also formed a search committee to find somebody capable of filling the position. <laughs> the good news, Mrs. Jones is wild about your sermons. The bad news, Mrs. Jones is also wild about the gong show and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. All right. The good news, your women's softball team finally won a game. The bad news, they beat your men's softball team. <laughs> this one I do know from firsthand experience. The good news, the church, uh, the church attendance rose dramatically in the last three weeks. The bad news, you are on vacation. Good news, your biggest critic just left your church. Bad news, he has become appointed the head bishop of your denomination. <laughs> All right, in the Word of God, and as we've been looking at Ephesians, we've been saying that going through chapter 4 and chapter 5 has been a lot like standing in the ring with Mike Tyson or BJ Penn. We're going to hear things that there's good news, things where we're encouraged and challenged, but at the same time, when God sets his standard, God's people have to be honest and say, Lord, I hear that, but I also see where I am not walking in consistency with that. Amen? And so we've been talking about that, that we want to come with an approaching of a heart that will hear conviction, not condemnation. So you who are visiting with us this morning, understand that is the spirit as we continue on in Ephesians chapter 15. This morning, if you are listening, if you are paying attention, you are going to some way, somehow be, quote, offended, meaning that the gospel is offensive. We are going to be challenged in areas that is God's standard, not necessarily our consistency. What we want to do this morning is say, Lord, where I need to be shaped, where I need to be molded, Lord, where I need to hear, speak to me, oh God. Help me not to elbow my husband or my wife or not to look around the room, but Lord God, I want to know the things where I can be iron sharpened iron, where I can be transformed in the renewing of my mind, that I can be made more like him so I can lead more to him. Amen? So this morning we're going to hear some good news and maybe sometimes some bad news, but what I'm praying for us right now is that we would be hearers no matter what. All right, well, let's quickly review chapter 5 as we uh, started through the first 14 verses last time. Let's first look at, remember, verse 1 there says, Therefore be imitators of whom? God. Now, one thing I noticed about imitating, in order to imitate something, you have to be what? You have to be knowledgeable. You have to be aware of it. You have to see it. Okay, if you're going to copy it. How many of you are the show me people? I'm a show me. You know, it's that old show me. Don't just tell me. Show me and I can do it. Take me to your house once and I'll never forget it again. I am that kind of person. Show me. So my wife and I go travel. We have the little roadmap thing, the little GPS. And all I have to do is do it once. Once I do it once, don't need the GPS. Put it away. Show me. He says, be imitators of God. And so we need to recognize where are we looking? What have we been looking at? What have we been spending our time with? And so he says, be imitators of God. And we looked at several verses. Verse 2, he says, and walk in love. We're going to talk this morning more about our walk walk. But when you're imitating God, obviously we're going to be walking in love because God is love. Remember, drop down to verse four. We talked about no, no filthiness talk or silly talk. And we talked about all those things, including things that we do on Facebook and all these other places, coarse jesting, things that are not fitting. Remember the little boy in clothes that did not fit him. When we are acting in inconsistency, it's not fitting to the Christian life. It shows a mixed message to the world. Wait a minute, you're saying this, but you're acting like this. And so that mixed message, in other words, someone says, are you going to the party? And you say, yes. That's what so often we look like. Yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. Yes, I believe everything in the Bible is true. Yes, I believe He is the only way, the truth, and the life. And yes, without Him, people will perish. We're saying one thing, but our lifestyle doesn't seem to be consistent with taking the time to share the gospel with someone with coffee and saying, listen, I know you know I'm a Christian. I know you know I go church. But do you know why? 
I want to just have half hour of your time to share with you why. It would mean the world to me if you would give me that opportunity. Are we doing this? Verse 5, for this you know with certainty. Remember that should be highlighted or underlined. For this you know with certainty that no immoral, impure person or covetous man or idolater has inheritance. Folks, there is a line in the sand. And although we want to blur it, it is there and is done by God. Verse 6 is so str- so strongly saying, let no one deceive you. It's not about good people. I'm glad you're a good person, but heaven's not a good place. It's a perfect place. And who gets to go? Only perfect people. Wait, no one's perfect. Ah, now you agree with the Bible. And that's where I have such a foothold when I begin to share my faith with someone. Nobody's perfect. Ah, now you're saying what Jesus said. And I begin to share with him what the Bible says that none are righteous, but we all need the forgiveness of God. Verse 11, then he told us to be the kind of light and dark, the lightness in the darkness. And it says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. We're not supposed to go there. We're not supposed to have an inconsistent message. But instead, we're even supposed to expose them. And remember, I talked about the cockroaches. When you turn on the light, what happens to cockroaches? They dig out. They run. But let me share one other thought with you. Eyes this way. When you're living right... When the light is turned on, it's actually a welcomed thing. When you're doing something, in other words, you don't do it to be in the light. Let's say you're serving a neighbor, you're doing something, and then somebody notices it and sees it and says, Hey, I saw you the other day giving such and such to Mrs. Johnson right on. You're like, Oh, thanks. Praise God. It's not something shame. You see, when you're living right, you're not afraid of the light. Does that make sense? And so we are to be that light which will expose darkness, not with fingers, not with signs. Nothing's ever been accomplished with that, but in heart, definitely, in lifestyle. And that's why verse 14 and where we ended off, it says, For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And that shining ought to be a good and pleasant thing. Yes, Lord, I am not a sluggard in my bed. I'm seeking to live a life, though I know I'm not perfect, my desire is perfectly committed to you. That's why verse 15 begins where we pick up today with what word? Therefore. Well, we just looked at what it's there for. All these things. To imitate, not walk in darkness, know for certainty that there is a consequences. And it says, therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Can I encourage you to underline or highlight? Be careful as you walk. Though a simple sentence, that is a very powerful and truthful phrase for all of us to meditate on this morning. You know, there's a good advice in being careful how you walk. The Bible talks a whole lot about our walk. Look overhead, if you would, at 1 Kings 3.13 says this, And if you walk in my ways, keep my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. God says, first of all, there's just a blessing. If we're going to walk the walk that we've been talking, he says, first of all, if you're doing that, I'm going to prolong your days. It will add to a long life. Now, I believe this is a spiritual blessing as well as wisdom. Ever you notice how you hear about somebody who gets jumped, beat up, murdered? So often it's sometime between 2 and 4 in the morning. Down on School Street or Hotel Street or whatever. I mean, come on. You see, if you're where God is calling us to be, we're in places where we're not even going to be putting our lives at risk. And so when the Bible says you walk in His ways, it's going to prolong prolong your life in a very practical, but then I believe God also spiritually. He will look over because if you are fruitful and faithful, and God's going to want to continue to use that. Now, John 12, 35 says this overhead. Jesus therefore said to them, For a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light. Now hear that, church, for us this morning. Listen, be careful as you walk. Now what is Jesus saying? Walk while you still have the light, that darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. Okay, now think about this. We've seen a whole lot in last week, as well as in Jesus' own parable here about light and darkness. There is a clear contrast that's being given to us. But isn't it funny how we live in a world that is so trying to blend the two? You know, like right now, backstage there, that's kind of dark. You can't see it, but the, the, the light is out here. But we try to live in this pluralism. But one of the things that I have found is that the darkness is completely pierced by light. If we were to turn off every single light in this whole room, and I took two rocks and I smacked them together, you would be able to see where I was on the stage because it didn't matter how much the light was, it pierced through the darkness. Are you following? 
You see, we are not to look at the immensity of the darkness around us. What we are asking is, God, am I, am I going to be a Christian? Someone who's going to ask to be filled with the light. You see, Moses came down and preached without a doubt the hardest sermon to the hardest congregation. Now, I've been with some tough crowds before, but I never had to preach the Ten Commandments to a drunken orgy. And that is exactly what Mo had to do. He came down with a thou shalt nots to a whole bunch of people who were naked and sauced. <laughs> Look at Mo's ass. What's up, Mo? But the Bible says the majority of the nation, in fact, almost all but 3,000 responded. Why? I believe without a doubt. It's because it wasn't just his words. But the Bible says that there was a glow about Moses. You see, folks, we need to go for the glow. We need to grow in the glow that we will glow in the dark. I'm sent out. I wish I could have every single sign here, but this isn't our building. That says, now entering the mission field. But I am called. I am sent out by the Lord. And he says, be careful how you walk. Why? Because people are watching. In fact, you are possibly the only light. Does your family, does your wife, do your children, do your classmates see a glow about you because you've been in the presence of the Lord? You see, that glow is a byproduct. The moon gives off no light of its own. It is completely reflected from the sun. Are we going to be those types of lights that are going to walk through? You see, it says here that those who walk in darkness don't know where they are going. Here's an interesting thought for you to connect the dot. Hawaii, we have a very sad statistic. Did you know that we in the nation lead for pedestrian deaths? We have the highest rate of pedestrian deaths in the nation for a state. And I shared with you several weeks ago, I think I know why. As I drive my car, as I look at people, as I was talking about, we were talking about in Ephesians 4, the sins of the heart, which leads to callousness, that callousness of self-centeredness. And I told you, people I see all the time just walking across the street, three or four cars just waiting there to turn left or trying to come across. And it's my time. I'm cruising. Not only that, we've got everybody wearing their earphones and something, some kind of iPod walking through just in our own little world. And you see what happens. It says, those who walk in the darkness, and what am I saying darkness is? These times have been very, very light. Yesterday I was coming home. It was very, very bright in the middle of the day. But I saw this person, and this person was easily in their 40s. This isn't a teenager problem. Was walking down the street. I was coming down to turn right off of Montserrat, and they did not even once look over their shoulder to see if a car was coming down. And I got a car right on my hind as we're coming down the hill. And so I'm trying to let this person know with flashing my lights that I'm going to have to stop because I can't turn right. And this person, as sure as I th thought they would, just... You see, walking in darkness, I can't think of a better darkness, a darker darkness than being alone in this world and not having vision, value, and purpose. Oh, you might see bright lights around you today. You're going to go, what is this guy talking? I'm talking metaphorically. Is your future bright? Remember that song in the 80s, my future's so bright I have to wear? Jeez. All right, there's a few that were alive in the 80s. <laughs> Yesterday I worked on the house all day and I went to that Pandora and hit 80s rock. It was a blessed afternoon. Devo, Depeche Mode. I'm like, whoa. Nee, 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 nee. Nee, nee, nee. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, the same is true here. If you are not paying attention to the light, if you are not walking in the light, well, what does it say in 1 Peter 5 and 1 Peter 5? Jesus warns, he says, be sober of the spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking what? If you're not paying attention... Your prey. I have written in my Bible, look at me. I have written in my Bible, pray, P R A Y, or be pray. P R E Y. And that is a reminder for me every day. Wax or pray or be pray, bro. Pray on the armor of God. Be filled up with the Spirit. The enemy is out there. He's a lion. Listen, Satan never has a good day. He never wakes up and says, ah, I'm just going to leave wax alone today. Not at all. He's miserable and he wants me to be too. All right, well, we need to be careful of our walk. And notice what he says in verse 16. He continues to say this, making the most of your time. Would you underline that? Making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now, time. Interestingly enough, time is mentioned 626 times. There. 
Time is a very important thing within the scriptures when it talks about that. But when it says that the days are evil, listen, it's not talking about this guy. That's not what we're talking about. No, no, no. When it's saying that the days are evil, it's talking about the context of time. Austin Powers. No, folks, it's saying that the clock is ticking. Jot this down, that the clock is ticking. And there is much work to be done, and the deceiver has been long at work. The deception, the deceiver has long been at work, and he's saying, guys, church, the clock is ticking. We need to make the most of our time. We've only got so many hours this day. What will we do with this day and the people around us in this day? The clock is ticking, and the deceiver has been long. He's been busy at work. You see, I can make more money, but I can't make more time. We need to understand that. Now, I have a question for us to ask each other. Ask ourselves, would God consider, listen to me, would God consider how you and I have been using this precious gift He's given us called time, would God consider us using it wisely? Now, just think about that. Think of it as it says, make the most of your time. Would God consider that you and I are making the most of this precious gift time? Or does he find us spending four to five hours in the middle of the night playing Halo? Or does he find us three to four hours on the phone or three to four hours watching television? Would God come down and give me a scorecard and say, yes, son. Yes, I see you've been making the most of your time. Are we doing these kinds of things or are we finding ourselves involved in all kinds of other nonsense and then complaining how we have such little... Hmm. See, that's the, that good news, bad news I was talking about. You have been given a precious gift. It's called time. We asked you today, would you consider taking some of your time, your precious time, and going loving on these guys on a boat that have been there since May 17th? Yikes. Why did we just hear about it now? And my heart was moved yesterday and said, we need to bring food. We need to bring Aloha. I thought nothing could brighten up that shit more than a bunch of kid art. Because kid art you don't get, but it's still happy. <laughs> Come on, Mom, you don't even get it either. Oh, pretty, Johnny. What is it? It's from your son. That's what it is. Oh, okay. But it's made in love, and that's what transcends. You see, folks, we need to be making most of our time. Why? So what does it tell me in verse 17? It says, so then what? So then waxer, so then congregation, so then Christian, do not be foolish. Listen, make the most of your time. Watch how you walk, but don't be foolish. But what? Understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, there's a couple of things here. The first thing it says for us is not be foolish. How would I translate that? What he's saying is don't just stick your head in the sand. Did you get what I'm trying to say in that, church? I think sometimes, come on, can I, I be a little intrusive a little as the coach a little iron sharpening iron i think sometimes we the church we the body of christ might be a little guilty of remaining in what i like to call the christian bubble we go to our christian gatherings around our christian friends we watch our christian station that's the good thing to do um (laughs) we're at christian places with christian friends and getting our milk from a christian cow but we're never finding ourselves being salt And light, salt where it's needed, light where it will bring forth. You see, one of the things that we need to ask ourselves is, are we these individuals who are just digging our heads in the sand and saying, I don't want to see all the evil. I don't want to know what's going on down the neighborhood. I don't want to read the newspapers because it just makes me sad. I don't want to listen to the news because it's bad news. Really? Well, this is the world that he's called you and I to transform. Are we going to be significant? Are we going to be effective? We only had to hear about these folks stranded. Now we can do something about them. You see, church, he's saying, don't be foolish. The days are evil, so don't be foolish as in just playing about yourself, just surfing, just doing everything that's all about me. No, no, no. We saw that in chapter 4. We need to break out of the it's all about me. It's about being faithful and full of faith, being fruitful today as Christians, as seeing the cross that Jesus died on for me, for you. And when I see that kind of love, it makes me want to emulate that love and say, God, you sacrificed for me as we saw last week. And as you sacrificed for me, Lord, help me to sacrifice for not only my family, not even only the church, but Lord God, that we would sacrifice one another. I had some very interesting news given to me. Amen. 
Matt came up to me. The, our, what, we have a ministry here called Entertaining Angels where we go downtown in spots where folks live on the streets and we just make relation. We make house it. We just want to be there. Sometimes we have food, not always, but we have opportunities because we always have love. And Matt told me last night they went down there. They went to Kakaako Park. He said there was at least three that came up to him. Where are you, Matt? Okay, there's at least three that came up to him and he said every single person in the team had somebody who came up to them and said, wow, it was real. I recognize you guys from Wednesday night. Really loved what you had to say. Three prayed with him to receive Jesus. Yeah. But folks, I, I, I got to be honest. Why am I as a pastor? You see this coming Wednesday, where are we going to meet? We're going to meet right here right here in this place because they were able to open up the door and so we told everybody on Wednesday night this is where we're going to come and I said but listen I want us to at least do it once a month out there in the park again but folks why once a month well I gotta be honest with you because it's a whole lot of work and I have the same group of Levites these same six eight nine men you know and women who come to help and set up on Sundays and set up on Wednesdays and those same folks they got jobs like you they got things to do I don't want to wear out the saints and so the question is are we going to be folks who hear these messages are we going to be like those in James who are hearers of the word but lack maybe in some of the follow through and the doing can we say you know Lord I don't want to just stick my head in the sand I don't want to be someone who's foolish meaning I don't want to see but when the people in the park tell me we were blessed because you were there, that does something in me. And I want to be a part of that church. You know, it's funny. Churches, congregants are always looking at the pastor. Trust me, us pastors talk about you. Oh, my congregation, bro. Oh, my congregation. Man. You know, we want to be a part of a happy church too. We want to be a church of a people who are sold out for Jesus. That makes our job a whole lot more fun. Let's go get them. Or let's go get them. Yeah. And we say, let's go. Let's go. He says, don't be foolish. And then the next thing is this. It says, understand what the will of the Lord is. Now think about that. Don't read that too quickly. But, don't be foolish, okay? But, transitional. Understand. Do you today, could you tell me you understand what the will of the Lord is? The will of the Lord for your life. You see, I would not say to a blind person, look over there. Because that's a cruelty. But Jesus said to a blind person, look over there. Because when he gave him the commandment, he gave him the power to see. When Jesus says, understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not sit in your chair and say, that's impossible. No, it's not. He has called us to do it. And he will give you the power to do it. Now, what does the word understand mean? Well, I did my little Webster's Dictionary. And as I did my Webster's Dictionary, this is what it says, to understand. It says, to be informed, to have or receive knowledge. Second definition, to know and comprehend the nature or meaning. Third definition, to have the same ideas as the person who speaks or, uh, or ideas which the person intends to communicate. You're talking to someone, you're saying, I want you to do this. And they go, I understand, I understand, I got it, I'll go do it. That's what it's saying, to understand. But notice what needs to be here. Notice to be informed, to receive, to know, to comprehend. This takes interaction, folks. This takes a context. What I'm saying is this is only accomplished by spending time in and with God and His Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You see, for us to understand the will of God, it's going to take that interaction and being around Him. You see, the need to seek God for His direction and to understand His will for our life, well, that explains the context for the next verse that most people have heard most of their life. Verse 18 says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, as I mentioned on Wednesday night, this is a verse that many are familiar with, but few understand. This is not a verse speaking about the evils of alcohol. How so often this verse had been used when I was a young child, throwing at me back and forth in Sunday school lessons or wherever it was. That is not the context and the content of the purpose of using this scripture. And we talked about it briefly on Wednesday, but let's look over it again. What is verse 18 about? Well, you've seen already this morning from verse 15 on, it's speaking about what? It's talking about that you and I as human beings, we have appetites. 
We have appetites. Mind, body, spirit, we have appetites. We long for, we hunger for things. We want this clothing or we want that. We, want, we have all different types of appetites. And the hungriest appetite is the appetite of the soul. Listen, you might have had a big breakfast this morning, but your spirit to this, this very morning is hungry within our soul. You see, every one of us has appetites. The question is, is where do we go to feed these appetites? He says, don't get drunk with wine because what happens when we go to that context, when we go to self-medication? mindset. He says, well, it leads to debauchery in the NIV, or the King James says, wherein there is excess. Meaning, when we turn to anything other than God to minister to that hole in our life, it leads to no good. Amen? You know, I've heard a lot of people share their testimony, that they've said, I had a hole in my heart, or I had a hole in my life, and I tried to fill it with everything, and nothing felt, filled it until I met Jesus. Well, I want to share with you, I understand the heart and I understand the description of that. But I tell you what, it's actually the opposite. Because the Bible talks about in James, it says that when God made us, He placed a piece of Himself within us, like a homing beacon. A little beep, 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 beep. And you see, that homing beacon is even what brought you here today. It's that homing beacon that connects with the maker and the maid. And that is why nothing on this earth will satisfy. That is why when he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. We need to ask ourselves this morning, listen, all of these guys who had wonderful successes, but end up killing themselves, shooting themselves with shotguns or whatever it may be, they had multiple successes. But you see, the flesh can bring success. Only the spirit cries for fulfillment. Are you fulfilled this morning in your spirit? See, that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. The man says, how can I be born again? I'm an old guy. I can't get back in my mother's room. He said, yes, but flesh gives birth to flesh, the temporal. But the spirit, the spirit. You see, he begins to explain this to me. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Keep your bulletin or something there with Ephesians, but go with me to 1 John chapter 2. Let's look at this subject a little deeper today on these appetites and where we need to find why we are or are not hungry. Where do we go to fill this void, this need in our life? Where is God's word and warning upon this? Well, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says this. It says, Christian, do not love the world. That word love there is agape, agapao. Do not love the world. That word world is the word cosmos. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Nor the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, is God saying that we can't love our wife, you know, love our car, love surfing? No, that's not what it's talking about. The Greek makes it really clear what it is talking about. First, as I said, agapao, agape, meaning do not have that un- Conditional love, the kind of love that God has for us, the kind of love that I'm supposed to extend to others, that kind of love I'm not, I should not hold my surfboard and say, I agape you. <laughs> now, I will confess this, and my wife will roll her eyes and tell you, yes, it's true. I did have a habit until about maybe the second year of our marriage that whenever I got a new board, I usually did sleep with it the first night. I had a queen size bed and I was single, okay? So it was possible, all right? You know, I put in there, my new friend. Hey, that friend might have to save my life someday, you know what I mean? Big set, holding on, you know? So that's not what it's talking about here. It's saying this agape love, this unconditional love, and to what? The cosmos. What is the cosmos? Write that down. It's meaning that which is secular meaning non of God, non-religious. You see, we are not to unconditionally love the cosmos. If you would look overhead, it says in Matthew 18, woe to the world, the cosmos, because of its stumbling blocks. That's what he's meaning there. Or Matthew 4, 8. And he showed us all the kingdoms of the world when he was tempting Jesus. Here's the cosmos. He says, these secular things, this is not what I'm supposed to be about. Listen, Christian, I am not to be so caught up in trance that my unconditional passions are for the temporal. Are you hearing me? We are not to be passionate about the temporal things the Bible is saying. Why? Well, here's a newsflash for you that you may or may not want to hear. But this pagan, this secular system, it actually hates you. Wait, 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 wait. What, what do you mean it, it, it hates me? Yes, the Bible says the world. What are you talking about? I have lots of friends at work. I go to the club and I'm not feeling any hatred. I'm da, da, da. What do you mean the world hates you? Well, don't take my word for it. But Jesus himself said in John 15 verse 18, he says the world hates you. 
you know that it has hated me before it hated you. In verse 19, he says, if you were of the world, there's that word cosmos, the cosmos, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So the question needs to be asked this morning is, are you completely, absolutely at peace at every place you go? If so, that might need to be a wake up call. That might be a red flag that you this morning are a chameleon. Green with the green, brown with the brown, no dramas anywhere. You see, we are to let our light so shine. Now, not as, a, as someone who just hits their headlights. You're driving and someone has their highlights and you're like, oh man, get off the high beams. No, 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 that's not where it's supposed to be. But nonetheless, you should be able to see the car because the car has its lights on. And if we are the people who are to be of the light, he's saying, listen, this world, this secular, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Meaning, not everybody loved Jesus. I'm so blessed when I find myself having difficulties in just getting the staff to go forward and understand what I'm trying to do. I'm so blessed when I hear Jesus himself say, oh, you. One of his own staff betrayed him. Oh, if Jesus couldn't have a perfect staff, even myself, praise God. And understanding that we have a secular system that is going the contrary and not everybody loved Jesus. Now, let's pay attention to that last part of verse 15. It says, if anyone loves the world, the love for the Father. Now, it says in that the love of the Father is not in them, but that love of is referencing in the possessive. And if I'm so filled with the things of this world, then I do not have a love for the Father. Look at me, please. Let me repeat what I said on Wednesday night. When you are filled up with something else, you do not have an appetite for other things. As I reminded you guys, if I was to come home from surfing and eat 10 bean burritos and eat them all up, they're sitting there on the table. I would be so filled that then my wife comes home with this huge plate of steak that was left over from a big potluck and it just mastered. What would I do? I would cry. Because I have no longer an appetite for this wonderful steak. Reverse the scenario. I come home and here's this big huge plate from the women's thing that she had. And it's all right there. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm eating all the steak. I ate five or six full on big old porterhouse steaks. Trying to win the bone. (laughs) The Filipino eat the bone. (laughs) And then my brother comes home. Hey. They had made too many at Taco Bell and they had burritos for 10 cents. I bought you five. And I go, just five? No, that's not what I would have said. (laughs) If he came home with these burritos, I would be like, that would look like roadkill to me. Why would I have no appetite for those things? Because I was filled with the steak. Why do we not find ourselves hungry for God? Hungry for the things of God. It says, if anyone loves the world, the love of, the love for the Father is not in him. If we are so finding ourselves struggling with quiet times, serving Him, ministering to Him, singing praise songs to Him, maybe it's because we're not hungry for the steak of God because we are so full of beans. And we got to get off this appetite of diet, I should say, this diet of the carnal things in this world and get back onto the Word of God. Listen, you spend four to five hours on your Facebook. Can you spend more than 20 minutes with God? Can we get into the Word of God, the way of God, the will of God, and find a transformation that is going to bless your soul? Your soul, not just your mind. You see, why should we not agape the cosmos? Well, 16 tells us. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, they're not from the Father. It's from the world. These are the big three that I taught about many times. The lust of the flesh, our passions. The lust of the eyes, our possessions. And the boastful pride of life, our position. And we are so caught up today in our passions, possessions, and positions. What degree I have. What people call me. What is on my business degree. What kind of income am I getting. These things that will matter not in eternity are consuming God's people. And he's saying, listen, this agapao, it's okay to have a good degree. It's okay to want to grow and mature in your lifestyle and in your positions. I'm not preaching against that. But if your vision, value, and purpose, your identity is found in only that which is temporal, realize how temporal it is. I used to always teach this with the junior hires. 
And I would say, why is your mom telling you you need to go home and you need to study right away so that you can get good grades? Why? So you can get good grades to get what? So you can get into the AP program. Why? So you get the AP program. Why? So you can get into what? A good school, right? So you get a good school, then you will get a good resume. And if you get a good resume, then you'll get a good job. And if you get a good job, you'll get a lot of these. And I hold up a dollar bill. And I say, if these are what's going to supposedly make you happy, let me show you what can happen to your happiness. I bring it out and and I hit it with a lighter. Go look how quickly your happiness can be removed. And without a doubt, every time I've done this, some junior hire goes, that's illegal. (laughs) That's the point. (laughs) What are we going to place as, hear me church, hear me, as value. What is your value this morning? What do you value? You see, back to Ephesians 5, now we see the context. In Ephesians 5, verse 18, it says, guys, so don't get drunk with wine, because that's dissipation, but be being, it's in the present active participle in the Greek, but be being filled with the Spirit. You see, what is our true thirst? My true thirst isn't a thing for the temple. My true thirst isn't, I need a beer. My true thirst is, I need to know that I'm at peace with my Maker. And I need to know that I am being a blessing and that I am blessed. That is the thirst that is inside that we may or may not recognize, but that is the truth. You see, what is our innermost thirst? It is our innermost being. Your innermost being is your true thirst, church. Your innermost being is your true thirst. I'm going to say it one more time. Your innermost being is where you have your true thirst. It's not here and it's not here. It's within you. You see, Christians will often ask, and sometimes not out loud, They'll say, if Jesus is the answer, then why do I still feel lonely? If Jesus is the answer, then why do I still feel dissatisfied or left like there's something more? Well, that's a question I love to answer, and I don't have a whole lot of time to go on that this morning. But let me just share with you real quickly that you are made by God fearfully and wonderfully in three distinct ways. Parts. You this morning, Christian, you have mind, body, spirit. You this morning, individual who has not yet become a born again believer, God has made you mind, body, and spirit. And as you see, you have these three tanks in your life mind, body, and spirit. You have your emotional tank, you have your physical tank, and your spiritual tank. And many of you today, you've been working out and healthy and emotional tank. Your, I mean, your physical tank is great. Your body and your physical thing is doing fine. Intellectually, you're growing. There is no great trauma in your life. You're not going through a painful divorce or something of that nature and so you're able to go out and surf and do things that fill up your laughter again fill up the person that just brings joy into your life your emotional tank your mind is at peace but you see the spiritual if you've not been pouring into this tank as well then recognize what that is going to do is it's going to create a sense of emptiness next picture because when you look at these three they see distinct but in reality you are one person and in one person (coughs) If your body is great and your mind is great, but if your spiritual is lacking, then you are going to feel an emptiness, a hole within yourself. And you're going to say, man, if Jesus is the answer, then why do I still feel lonely? Jesus is there, but what have you been doing in strengthening the other part? Now, listen, many of you this morning, you're on fire with the Lord. You're walking with Jesus. Your quiet time is great. And your body, there's no major, major problems within you. But you're also feeling this feeling. Why? Because when's the last time you just played? When's the last time you did those things that made you laugh when you were in high school? Have you completely pushed out the need to replenish your emotional tank and say, I'm going to get away from this desk. I'm going to set these gardening tools down. I'm going to, and I am just going to go back down to the beach and swim out to the flagpole of Kaimana and back. I'm just going to do something that washes me. God made us to enjoy the elements. Amen? Come on. The devil didn't make surfing. That's too much a work of God. (laughs) For what else causes men to pray but a cleanup set? Huh? Huh? Fifteen footer comes outside. There's not an atheist in the water. (laughs) Molokai, I'd hear him saying, Pray for me, Reverend! But you see, some of you, maybe wives, you haven't let your husband go do because it looks like it's just playing. No, don't remove the man that you fell in love with because part of the man was those things that made him or her laugh. 
When's the last time you let your bride just go out and be with the girls? Does she always have to be mommy? Does she always have to be your wife? Can she go out and be that woman that you fell in love with again and filling up her emotional tank, her spiritual tank, and her physical tank? See, that's what God has made us to be. We need to pay attention to the whole counsel of God. You see, but that spiritual tank, listen, it's in the present active, but be being filled. Let me show you a few other scriptures and notice the context. Just look overhead. Deuteronomy 34, 9. It says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses has laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him. Acts 4, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people. Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It's this present active thing that's coming upon them. Not a one-time thing. Acts 7.55. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand as Stephen was comforted by the filling of the Holy Spirit. Acts 13.52. And the disciples were continually, continually filled with the joy and the Holy Spirit. I hear people saying all the time, especially those who come from some of my Pentecostal circle friends, so when were you filled with the Holy Spirit? My answer, hopefully 10 minutes ago. When I asked. You see, church, how do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? Does it take 10 people in a room laying hands on you? Do you have to be in the hot seat? Do you have to... Da, da, da? No, let me show you. This one I want you to turn with me. Go to Luke chapter 11, please. Go to Luke chapter 11 and join me at verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father... What's it say, church? Give the Holy Spirit to whom? To those who ask. Isn't that awesome? How do you and I begin to be be being filled in the Holy Spirit? Ask. Do you need to get on your knees? No. The one thing about posture, posture really affects attitude. I find my prayer life is more petitional when I'm on my knees. Why did we think it was good as children to stand by our bed and do this, but somewhere, somehow we got too old for that? How cool would it be, dads, if your kids came downstairs and they saw you in the living room and there's the lazy boy chair and instead of sitting in it, you're in front of it with your elbows on it and you're praying for your family for that day. And saying, Father, fill my cup. Fill my family with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Anoint me, I pray, that we might be faithful and full of faith. That we might be anointed this morning. You see, how are we filled? By prayer, by supplication, by requesting. But now go back to Ephesians because we have another way. Ephesians verse 19. Notice this is right after verse 18. God never intended 18 to be used exclusively. He says, but don't get drunk with wine. Don't be going to that get drunk. I want you to get drunk on something way better. I want you to get drunk on the Spirit. I want you to be filled to the fullness of this Holy Spirit where you're under the influence, not of alcohol. You're under the influence of the Lord God. How does this happen? Well, by asking. But there's also another way in which this is matured and strengthened. It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all the things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Amen? You see, folks, that's why fellowship is so important. Hear me again. How do we get filled with the Spirit? Well, by asking, but there's also a filling of the Spirit that comes in fellowship. It fills us up. Listen, this kind of fellowship does not come on solo missions. This kind of fellowship isn't found in just saying, hey, I'm taking my Bible and, my, and, my, and a piece of paper and going off and spending time with the Lord. That's awesome and that's great and that is important. But the Bible is telling me this morning that to be enriched, to be filled up to the fullness of God, I ask for it, but it's also stimulated as iron sharpens iron, encouraging one another. Some of you would remember this illustration, but allow me to repeat it because it's important. Back in the day when I was a kid, we used to have to go to the beach and we actually had to carry our own little grill. It was called a hibachi. There was no, do you have the gas? It was, do you have the charcoals? And do you have the paper? And do you have the match? And everything else. And being as every child is, a pyro. (laughs) My father was smart in delegation. He said, pyro, you start the fire. 
And so I learned that I take all those coals and I would just make a nice mound. But before I did that, inside I would put some newspaper and I would just drench it with lighter fluid. (laughs) Then cover it with the coals. Then over the coals. (laughs) Get the match. Surfers on the beach. What was that? (laughs) Out in the water. There was a beacon of light. (sighs) The hibachi was this big. The fire was this big. (sighs) And then if dad wasn't looking. (sighs) Yes. But joined together, filled with that lighter fluid, they quickly turned this beautiful red glow. And then Pops would come and he would look and he'd go, they're ready. And he would spread them all out across the barbecue and put the grills on and begin to put the burgers on. But then we begin to notice something. One of the coals here, when he spread them out, rolled off to the edge. And it was still in the container, but it was off here on the edge. And that coal, being separate from the others, started a change from being red hot to starting to look a gray a colorless, effectiveless, no warmth flowing from gray. Oh, it was still a coal, but it was not doing what it was made to do. And you know what only needed was some prongs to fit underneath it and throw it back in the midst of the fire, and almost immediately it would come back to fruition of what it was made and its purpose to do. And the Lord showed me one day, that's my church. People always say, do we have to go to church to be a Christian? Well, no. But if you are a Christian, what you want to do is go to church. (laughs) It says, do not forsake the gathering together. You see, we come together. And as we pile one and one on one another, we're coming together and we get the lighter fluid of the Holy Spirit. (sighs) And then the match of Jesus Christ as it comes through the Word and through song and woof. And we're finding ourselves filled. Oh, we always think about on Wednesday nights the 9 o'clock feeling versus the 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, I don't want to go. 9 o'clock, do I have to go home? Anyone going to CPK? Anyone doing that? Complete difference. This morning you woke up, is it really Sunday? (laughs) Can I just worship at First Church of the Inner Springs with Pastor Pillow and Reverend Sheets? No, because Waxer will say something to make me feel guilty. (laughs) And yet you're going to find when church is done, that movement of the Spirit of God on His people. That's what He says what happens. Speaking melody in psalms with one another, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making joy, always giving thanks for the things in the name of the Lord Jesus. In verse 21, and be subject, hear me church, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This is my concern for many here this morning. This is my concern for you. I pray for you. I fear that there are many who do not have an accountability in the church today. You see, is there anyone in your life who can say, I see you? Not noticed you, not acknowledged you, but say, I see you. Is there anyone in your life who you have given that, that can give you honest and credible feedback. You see, we have turned so much of this Christian pilgrimage and study and learning into this solo mission, but that's not what Jesus says. He says, be subject to one another. Subject is the word submissive. We're going to look at that next week in a context that has caused a lot of people a lot of anger on what it really means to be submissive. He's saying, are you willing to be submissive? Is there someone in your life who can speak into you? You see, there are in Christianity, there are no lone rangers. Because even the Lone Ranger had Tanto. Who's your Tanto? Mmm, Kimasabi, bad idea. No go town. Mm, they're going to beat you up and kill you in town. No, Kimasabi, no go. Sad thing is, I think 20 people even got my mercenation. How many of you actually remember watching this show? Ah, more than 20, right on. The rest of you, you really missed it. But listen, come on, let me have your eyes this way, please. Is there someone 
Listen, is there someone in your life who can tell you no? See, why are we struggling so much in our walk today? Because we're such an individualized society. We no longer even say teams. We say Kobe versus so-and-so rather than the Lakers versus the Celtics. Go Lakers. I mean, nothing. We don't do... (laughs) You're so bad. Okay. We're so individualist. Look at the talk shows. When you go into other countries, the talk shows have five people on the panel. What do we have? We had just Johnny. We had so-and-so, Dave, you know, Leno. All, it's all about an individualism. And now we, we, we brought that into our Christian lives. Is there someone in your life who can say, no, I don't think that's a good thing. And you have submitted. Or do you say, well, y'all listen to them as long as they say da 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 but when I, Because if you always have this, I've got this, me and God. Well, the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, his word is confirmed. You see how, this is how a lot of these guys on TV are getting away with the things they are teaching because they're being approached by other people and these other people are being told that they're finger pointers or they're sinners when really they're just trying to hold them accountable to the scriptures and they're saying, but God has told me. And if that is your answer and it is not consistent with those who are most around you, careful, red flag. You see, Romans 13, 1. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. We're called to be submitted even there. For there is no authority except from God. Do I believe that God is large and in charge or not? And those exist are established by God. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief. For this would be unprofitable for you. I had a set of parents who did not want this particular person in their family to marry another person. Now this person was 20-something years old. And this 20-something year old was in love with another Christian and this Christian and them. They loved one another. They came here. We met them. We were in love with them, so on and so forth. And this parent said, this is not right. I do not want this person. And so this dad would come up to me and he would say, well, the Bible says, obey children, obey your parents. And he would quote the verse, children, obey your parents. And I said, well, if we're going to play that card, then I'm going to pull out the Hebrew and it says, obey your leaders and I'm your leader. So which one are you going to do? You see, you know what the first words were? Well, it doesn't mean the same thing. Have you submitted to the authority, to the headship of one love, or have we just been those folks who just kind of float in, just do the style of our Christianity, like a little bit of this, a little bit of that? Or are you going to say, you know what, I'm going to let the word of God and the people here, I believe Jesus is here, and though I may not always agree on everything on the gray areas, if it's a black and white in the Bible, I'm going to say, I need to submit to those who want my best, the shepherd who wants to lead me to the sheep. I mean, lead me to the, feet, to the food. Listen, Christianity is just one beggar telling other beggars where I found food. But are we going to be the people who are going to say, yes, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. I'm not talking lordship. You know that. This isn't a shepherding church where you have to check in with somebody to know whether you should shop. Verse 23 of chapter 10 says, Let us hold fast the confessions of our hope without wavering. For he who promises faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate, not dominate, stimulate one another towards love and good deeds. And not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another all the more. All the more. Let's encourage one another. Why? Last verse and we're done. Healthy introspection, church. Healthy introspection is good. It's good. Healthy introspection introspection is good for the soul it says this in second corinthians thirteen five. look yes this is in the bible look overhead test yourselves to see if you are in the faith examine yourselves or do you not recognize this about yourselves that jesus christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test you see i have three questions for us this morning as we go out our scriptures started off with Be careful how you walk in verse 15. It ends in verse 21. Be subject to one another. Where are you? Where am I in the midst of these questions? Let me ask you this question. How is your walk today? How is your walk today? Who are you walking with? The answer will be found in how you're spending your time. And how you're spending your time will tell you because the Lord already knows. How your walk's going. Number two, are you going to the wrong well? Are you forgetting to fill up in the spirit? 
As I said on Wednesday, loneliness is the malnutrition of the soul that comes from feeding on substitutes. You see, are we full of beans? Are we full of the stake of God? Our true thirst is our innermost being. Has your fellowship with the body of Christ been consistent? Or have you been pulling a lot of lone rangers? Have you been speaking to others in songs and psalms and spiritual songs and blessing one another? You see, it's not just the blessing you get, it's the blessing you give. And when you give, you get. That's Christianity. How is your walk? Are you going to the wrong well? And number three, today, do you today know what the will of God is? Do you know what the will of God is for your life? I will tell you this straight up, dear one. It begins with being born again. That's his first and foremost will for you today. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. How do you become born again? Nicodemus asked this question. How can I be born again? I'm an older man. How can you today in this room? It's simple as this. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. And when you were made by God, you were mind, body, and spirit. Today, your body and mind might be in wonderful shape. But this message has begun to stir you within your spirit, and you've recognized that you are not a perfect person. And for that imperfection, Jesus went to the cross. And Jesus died on a cross for you and for me. Jesus saw that we were not perfect people. Oh, we may be good people, but we were not perfect. And for this reason, Jesus said, I will take that sin of yours. You see, God made you to have a relationship with him. But because you were born with a sin nature and I have a sin nature, the church can't help you. Good, Do gooding won't help us. It's not about that. It's about God who so loved the world that he gave his only son. There's your Christmas story. He came as a virgin to bypass the sin nature. He came and took the form of God in a bod through the virgin. And that is your Christmas story. He came to this earth, lived a sinless life. So then at the cross, there's your Easter story. He took that sin. So now your hand is free to receive the hand of God that has been down you. We are all God's creations, but we are not all God's children children. You are only his child when you today will say, Jesus, I will acknowledge you as father. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And I know there's no other way but through you. And so Jesus, I need your forgiveness in my life. And I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. If you need to do that today, as each of us in this room who have had to do that, who are Christian, I invite you to do it right now. I encourage you to do it right now. And what it is, it's done by an honest submission of your own life and saying, listen, I've been the master of my destiny and I've seen where that's led. And today... I want that grace and forgiveness.